everyone. It's great to be here with you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And uh, I've done this a thousand times, but I want to make sure that uh, you can see it. So if you could give me a thumbs up in the chat, uh, if you can see it, wonderful. Um, so again, my name is Ryan Gleha. I am the diplomat in residence for the Department of State for the Northwest. And it's a real pleasure for me to interact with you today. Um, you wonderful UW students. Um, I look forward at some point being able to, to meet you in person uh, there in Washington. But uh, let, let me start with a uh, little bit about myself, who am I? Um, like I said, diplomat residence for the Northwest. I've been a foreign service officer now for 19 years. I'm a member of the senior foreign service class of minister counselor. So the, the equivalent of a, of a two-star general uh, in the military parlance there. Um, I'm not from the Northwest, but I am from uh, the Southwest. I went, uh, I'm from Arizona. I went to Arizona State as an undergrad. I did my graduate work at the University of Pennsylvania. I've been in about 19 years in the Foreign Service and I work as a public diplomacy officer. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, when we get a little further into the presentation. Uh, most of my career has been in the Middle East. I've, I've done two assignments in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. My very first assignment in the Foreign Service, I was a visa officer there in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, right after 9-11. And then uh, my last, my most recent overseas assignment where I just completed this summer was also in Jeddah. I, can't, I went back as the consul general or the principal officer, uh, the head of the post there, leading a team of about 350. Uh, and there in that capacity, I was also the US representative to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is headquartered there in Jeddah. I've done a lot of other assignments. Uh, uh, Doha, I was the deputy chief of mission and the charge d'affaires, the acting ambassador for a year in Qatar. Uh, London, I was the Arabic language spokesperson for the Department of State uh, and the director of the regional media hub that's headquartered there at the embassy in London. Um, my two tours in Beirut, I was the cultural affairs officer and then the public affairs officer. Uh, and Sana'a, I was the public affairs officer. And then DC, I worked uh, for a year as the special assistant to the Undersecretary of State for public diplomacy and public affairs. So lots of different types of jobs. And that's one of the beauties of this, um, this career is you get to, lots, to do lots of different things over the course of, uh, of, a, of a career. Uh, I speak a number of languages. Probably the, the best one I've got left is Arabic. Um, and then um, my family has followed me around in this adventure. My wife works in um, counterterrorism policy and, and uh, democracy promotion. And we've got two little Foreign Service kids, six years old and four years old. Um, so living here now in, in the Berkeley area, this is their first time living in America. Uh, so they're, we're pretty excited about them getting introduced. My son was very excited to see that America also has McDonald's as opposed to the places that he's been living in. So. Uh, but who are we? Who is the Department of State? You probably are familiar with, with who we are, and hopefully you are at this point uh, in your studies. But um, we're the oldest cabinet agency. We are the, the foreign affairs lead for the, for the US government. Uh, little known fact, why are we called the Department of State? Uh, it's because we used to be the entirety of the state that wasn't uh, uh, allocated to another department. So back in the 18th century, when there was only like three, three or four cabinet uh, departments, the state did foreign policy plus everything else. Uh, that wasn't a part of defense or part of war at that time or, or another cabinet agency. We used to deliver the mail. We used to actually coin the coin, print the money too. Uh, but uh, all of those mess, mess, uh, missions got spun off and but we have retained that foreign policy, foreign affairs lead. Uh, and that's what we do. We promote and protect American interests overseas. We protect American citizens overseas. Uh, we do a lot of work that is, it is completely uh, opaque to most Americans, but it affects every American's life. Um, we're a small agency. You can see the numbers there, about 77,000 employees, but you kind of have to break out 50,000 of those immediately. Those are our um, locally employed staff members, usually nationals of the host country in which we have an embassy or consulate that, that work there. They're essential, but, uh, but if you look at our, our, uh, our core American direct hire uh, personnel, it's, it gets really small really quickly. So it's about, about 27,000 employees, uh, about 13,500 of them are foreign service employees. Uh, 8,000 of them are, like myself, Foreign Service officers or Foreign Service generalists. Uh, another 5,500 are specialists. Um, and then we have about 11,000 colleagues that are in our civil service that are part of the part of the State Department, part of our development efforts, but primarily serve domestically in Washington. Uh, we also have a couple of other categories of employee employment there. I won't necessarily go into, into much detail, though. The Consular Fellow Program, we'll talk about a little bit. This is, a, this is an interesting option for folks who, um, who may be interested in, the, in a Foreign Service career here. Um, but I'd li also like to talk about our, um, our focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility at the Department of State. We historically have not had a really great record of this. Um, and partially that's because of a sort of, a, we have sort of an 18th century aesthetic in many things. And, and that's, that's a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, in the case for diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility, it really is, uh, it is a bad thing. Um, so we have now made a huge focus, especially in our recruitment efforts, to recruit for the Foreign Service 
um, to make sure that our foreign service is actually representative of the United States in a complete way. Um, and that's one of the, the strengths of our story overseas. And that's one of the things that we talk about quite a bit with our foreign interlocutors is the fact that we are a diverse multicultural country. Um, and that argument is undercut when we have uh, a less than diverse um, group of people that are representing us overseas. So our, one of our, our, actually our top priority for foreign service recruitment is recruiting for diversity, uh, recruiting for representation within the, within the uh, United States population to join the foreign service. And so we now have a chief diversity and inclusion officer. Uh, that's Ambassador Gina Abercrombie Wynn Stanley. She actually was my first boss in the Foreign Service. So I got to work with her very early on in my career. And, um, and we are now having um, not only the focus, but also putting together the mechanisms and the priorities and the resources behind not just recruiting for diversity, but also retaining and promoting uh, and assigning folks um, uh, for, uh, with an eye to and with a, with a value of, of true representation. Uh, and that's a new thing and it's a good thing. Um, unfortunately, it's a new thing, but uh, fortunately, it is a good thing. Uh, but what's our pitch? What does a what does a career in the foreign service look like, and, and why why would you even consider uh, working for the State Department? Um, I really can't think of a more purposeful career uh, than than one that uh, I've followed, or one that my, my colleagues and I have followed here at the Foreign Service. We are doing work that is uh, meaningful, that has impact, uh, that affects people's lives, whether they realize it or not. Uh, it contributes to security, it contributes to the, the U.S. Um, uh, uh, national security, it contributes to our economy, it contributes to wellness and uh, overall prosperity, uh, not only for the United States, but also for our trade partners. And so um, really, if, if you look for pound for pound, you know, only about 20,000 of us are working in, the over, in an overseas environment uh, from the U.S. direct hire side. Uh, pound for pound, we're, we're the most impactful um, uh, federal agency. Um, because we are an elite organization, because we only really take the best of the best, um, your colleagues are all exceptional. Um, really the high, high level of performance, high level of expectations of everyone's performance there. Um, it's, I don't know any other career where you get to do something new every two to three years. I, I ran through my resume. I've done in the, in the period of 19 years, so many different jobs, so many different uh, types of responsibilities. It's always something changing a new career, or excuse me, a new challenge. Um, maybe you're learning a new language, a new culture every a couple of years. Nothing else in the in, that I know of uh, is similar to that. Um, you're, if you'd like to live overseas, this is this is the career for you. You're spending probably about two thirds to three quarters of your career at post overseas. You're going to spend some time in Washington, uh, in rotations at headquarters in, in Washington D.C. Uh, we we invest in the training, uh, both professional and language training for all of our colleagues. Um, you know, if you don't know a skill, we're going to teach it teach it to you. Uh, and that can include learning a new language, that can include learning a new trade craft, um, but there's a huge investment. You could spend uh, sometimes several years in training before you go to, out to an assignment. So if you're a linguophile, uh, this is a great career for you because you'll get paid to learn languages. Um, all the, uh, our, our, we have a unique personnel system that's modeled after um, the US Navy where it's kind of an up or out system where you're competing with peers for promotion and assignments. Um, if you're not promoted in a certain time frame, you, you leave the service. Um, and sort of that creates an environment where there's a lot of, lot of great achievement um, and promotions are, are really given out um, to folks that excel. And it, that, that spirit of, excel, of excellence and that, that uh, environment of excellence really helps feed really great performance. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderfully challenging environment to be in. Um, and then, you know, from a compensation package uh, prospect, and we'll talk about we'll a slide about this in a couple of minutes, um, you know, we can't really compare necessarily salary to salary with the private sector. But if you look at the overall benefit packages um, that are available to foreign service officers, especially when you're overseas, it's incredibly generous, um, including you know, free housing, free education, uh, at private schools for your children, uh, additional bonuses, that sort of thing. It really is, uh, can be a comfortable career. Um, and then because of your service in a unique way, you are rewarded with a very comfortable retirement and a, a full pension uh, with only 20 years of service, which is um, really remarkable in the 21st century. I actually even talked about a uh, pension existing, let alone a full one with only 20 years of service. But what are the options here? I mean, I think many people have, uh, you know, Hollywood hasn't really done a great service to the State Department, I, I, I got to say. But really, there's not, uh, there's not any, there's not a couple that really, there's a, just a couple of films out there that even address uh, American diplomacy. And, and usually we're the nerds or the people getting in charge, getting in, 
uh, in the way of the spies or the military that want to do something really cool. Um, if you ever saw that movie, The Kingdom with Jeremy Piven playing an American diplomat, just as a horrible recommendation of the State Department. Um, but uh, so, you know, maybe people, you've got an idea of what we do. If, if it's from Hollywood or if it's from media, it's probably not quite correct. But um, but if you have any sort of stereotypical idea of what a diplomat does, it's probably these first, these first five career tracks that maybe people think of most. Uh, these are our foreign service officer or foreign service generalist tracks. And these are the people that are, you know, the, tend to be the folks wearing the, the business suits, uh, meeting with folks in the in the former in the in the host the host nation government, uh, having discussions and talking about areas of, of mutual cooperation or mutual competition. Um, so these five tracks are consular, which are our people that um, uh, adjudicate visa applications and they assist Americans overseas with visa application with uh, passport applications and uh, assist them if they get into trouble. Uh, we have our economic officers that study and write about and analyze economic trends in a given country. Uh, management officers who run our embassies and consulates and, and make sure that we're um, have everything in all the resources in place, human, financial, physical, uh, to make sure our mission is successful. Our political officers uh, follow political trends in a country, write reports about that, and often do a lot of the government to government um, engagement. And our public diplomacy officers are the ones that engage publics overseas, um, working with working to do media engagement. Including social media engagement, as well as all our cultural and educational engagement, running our, our cultural programs and educational exchange programs. But there are a myriad of other career tracks that we have uh, through our foreign service specialist tracks. We have we have 17 of these tracks that many many people don't realize are part of our diplomatic efforts. Um, so we have our you know if you if you have a business background, uh, we have several career tracks here: financial management officer, general services officer, human resources officer, facility manager. These we hire diplomats to do this work for us. Uh, so that includes making sure our budgets are square. Uh, general services are, are kind of a jack of all trades. You know, if we have a problem, we need a contract solution for something. Our GSOs are the ones that go and, and solve those problems for us. HR, human resources, every organization needs a good HRO. Uh, and so that we, uh, we we definitely hire and recruit for that. And facilities, often we are we are running the most modern facility in a given country. And so uh, finding folks that, that are able to to run run a, a facility. Uh, like an embassy or a consulate um, in, a, in a challenging environment, that's, a, that's an incredible uh, challenging job that we have some really talented facilities managers. But beyond that, we, you know, we, we require, we recruit folks with STEM backgrounds as well. We hire a ton of engineers, for example, to work with us on our information systems uh, programs, making sure building, maintaining, protecting our secure communication systems, also working with um, us to develop modes of that data visualization to help inform our, our policy formation um, uh, discussions. Uh, on the security front, we hire engineers to help us uh, keep the building safe, to make sure that the technical security of our facilities are right, to make sure that we are protected against intrusion uh, from other countries. Um, we also hire architects and construction engineers to help us build these consulates and build these embassies. Um, so I don't know how many architects are going to architecture school and thinking about, hey, I'm going to be a diplomat one day, but, but we do have quite a number of architects that are diplomats with us. Um, on the health front, we hire doctors and nurses and med, um, psychiatrists and physicians assistants and laboratory scientists to help us keep our communities healthy. Uh, we also have an entire law enforcement agency that's embedded within the State Department called the Diplomatic Security Services. This is the one positive uh, Hollywood note, I must say, if you've seen the Fast and Furious series, series so that the, the Rocks character, I don't even know what the name of the character is in, in Fast and Furious or whatever one it was, Fast 7, Fast 9. I don't know what we're up to. He was a diplomatic security service agent. Uh, I don't think it was a particularly accurate uh, view. At least it was positive, if, if not accurate uh, view of, of the DSS. Anyway, but we do have a, a law enforcement agency that, that works, uh, conducts uh, investigations overseas, assists in, in securing personnel and facilities overseas as well. Uh, and they also deploy in the United States and, and work with uh, foreign diplomat, foreign diplomatic missions in the United States to make sure they're secure. Our diplomatic couriers, uh, if you'd like to travel, this is the job for you. These are the folks that make sure our secure shipments get everywhere overseas uh, safely and securely. And then we have two sort of uh, public diplomacy specialist tracks, uh, our public engagement specialists. They help embassies uh, devise and develop public engagement strategies, including through social media. And then our regional and English language officers, our regional English language officers, they help promote teaching English as a second language overseas. So these are the people with, with uh, TESOL um, uh, accreditations there. So a lot of different jobs, a lot of different career tracks um, that uh, include many things that people don't necessarily understand or see immediately as part of a diplomatic effort here. Um, 
benefits are myriad. Um, you can you can read on the screen there are a few of them here. Um, we already talked about training and the commitment to, to professional development here. Um, all of your moving expenses, you're moving all the time, so we take care of all of your moving. You, the packers come, they pack you up, they unpack you when you're there. Uh, moving sucks, but having someone else do your packing and unpacking definitely makes it a little bit a little bit easier to thing to bear. Um, I won't go through all the vagaries of pay. So you have your base pay, but you also, depending on where you're in the United States, you'll get a different additional locality pay. If you get over if you're overseas, you'll get overseas comparability pay. You may get also a hardship or danger pay percentile, percentile up to 50% of your base pay, depending on where you're serving. Um, you'll also get a cost of living adjustment if it's more expensive in the city you live versus what it would be costing in DC. And you get eligibility for the student loan, pay, loan, student loan repayment program uh, through service in the foreign service. Uh, the retirement benefits, I talked about the pension already. You also get a 401k equivalent called the Thrift Savings Plan. You get access to the federal uh, health benefits and, and life benefits, which are you know, some of the best uh, available in the United States. Um, you know, overseas, you get free housing, you get free uh, education for your kids, private schools. My kids went to the top private school in Jeddah. I uh, couldn't afford that on my own, but Uncle Sam paid for it because that was the best school for, for, for the children overseas. Um, very generous annual and sick leave. Um, and then we also, because of the, this is as much as it is a job and a career, it is also a lifestyle in the foreign service. Uh, we understand that there is impact on, on the, f the family of foreign service employees, including uh, most importantly spouses. It's sometimes difficult for a spouse who is not in the foreign service to, to maintain a career or to maintain employment at the very least because of the mo of moving every couple of years. So we look for ways in which we can enhance and, and employ spouses at embassies overseas, provide training for them, provide them support professionally so they can continue to develop while the employee uh, continues in their career. Uh, and then the community itself is incredibly tight knit. We, this is a unique living experience. Not a lot of people get to live in this way. And I'm still 19, I'm 19 years in, my mom just still doesn't understand what I do or how I live. <laughs> and so uh, we're often looking to, for support from peers as to you know solving problems or going through and growing through certain, uh, certain things in one's life that's typical of a foreign service officer. Um, so the community itself, we really, we really do come together. So it's a very, very supportive environment to, to, to live. But so who are we looking for? You know, uh, I think there's a misconception that you have to be an international relations major or, or political science major or at the Evans School, <laughs> you know, in order to get into the board. These are all great things. We, we're happy to have folks join us uh, from all these backgrounds. But ultimately, the, for the Foreign Service generalists uh, um, um, tracks, we really don't have a requirement um, of a specific job program or a specific uh, uh, degree program that you're coming from. We are really recruiting for these 13 dimensions you see on the, on the screen. Um, you know, I have a degree in religious studies. You know, I have two degrees in religious studies. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I found success in the Foreign Service. And it really has less to do with what you study and whether you can develop these soft skills, these attributes that we've studied and tracked and, and found the most successful diplomats are the ones that have these. 13 dimensions. And what it boils down to is can you communicate effectively? Can you work collaboratively? Can you think critically? Can you use good judgment? Can you deal with ambiguity? Can you, you know, look for look for solutions when solutions are not necessarily apparent? Um, and so our entire intake process is really sort of developed in order to try to find folks that have these 13 dimensions. You know, for our um, specialist jobs, obviously, if you don't have a degree in construction engineering, we're not going to hire you <laughs> as a construction engineer. You know, not a lot of religious studies majors uh, working in construction engineering for the State Department. Um, but, um, you know, for those jobs, we, we really are looking for folks with, with specific uh, um, uh, credentials, in addition to having uh, these, these dimensions, uh, as I mentioned before here. But it is a long process to join the Foreign Service. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm kind of an interesting recruiter in this role as diplomat in residence because, you know, I go to these career fairs and, you know, I'm next to a booth with someone like IBM or, or Alphabet or something like that. And they've got, hey, I'm going to hire 65 people from this fair. I have zero jobs to offer you. I have a path that you can start down and potentially at the end of this uh, long path, there might be a job offer. So like for the Foreign Service, you can see there's, we've got nine steps there um, and it can take on average now about 24 months from the time you take an exam to the time that you actually are offered a job uh, within the foreign service. So it's something to bear in mind. Um, it, it's, uh, it's not something where you can really, you know, I always tell people, you know, you have to live your life. If you want to join the foreign service, that's great. Start the process, but you have to live your life as if it's not going to happen because it definitely won't happen on any timetable that's convenient to you. Um, and, uh, and because it's such a competitive process, 
there you may not be successful your first time or your second time through the process. In fact, the vast majority of, of foreign service officers have to take the exam multiple times before they are successful. And it all starts with an exam. So we have the, the foreign service officer test that we offer three times a year. Um, you, the next one will be offered at the end of January and early February, and you can register for it starting in a couple of weeks time at the end of, of December here. Um, but then, you know, if you're taking the counselor, there's a counselor fellows, uh, uh, excuse me, counselor fellows test, there is an information management specialist test, or an office management specialist test, all other specializations um, don't require a written test, and they kind of just skip down to the qualifications evaluation panel. So if you take the written test, you pass it, that's great. You then go on to the QEP. The QEP is we look at your resume, we look at your personal statements, your personal narratives. Um, and then if you pass that, then you go on to the oral assessment, which is a day long in person uh, series of interviews and exercises that you do. If you pass that, then you go on to your security and medical clearances. If you pass that, you go on to a suitability review. And then if you pass that, finally, you are on the list of people that are eligible to be hired. Uh, and so you still don't have a job at that point. Uh, you're, you're on that list of eligible hires. And then from that list, we, we invite people to join our orientation classes to join the Foreign Service. Um, so it's, there's, there is attrition at each of those stages here. So depending on the year and, and that final number of people that we hire really is based on a lot of things, based on our budget, based on our, our projected attrition. It's also based on politics a little bit by, by uh, what, the, what the administration wants to do with the State Department. So sometimes it could be we're, we're taking 1% of the people that start the process, uh, make it all the way through. Sometimes it's a little bit higher than that. Um, but I don't want to say that by means of discouragement. I'm just saying it is competitive. And so sometimes not uh, being successful a first time or a second time has nothing to do with you. It has something to do with our process and, and how many people we're going to take in a given year. We had a recent person that joined a, um, an A100 class, an orientation class, that had taken the Foreign Service exam five times. And uh, first time, second time, third time, it failed at some way, some one of those steps, maybe at the first step, maybe at the seventh step, I'm not sure. The fourth time she made it all the way through to the end, got, got hired or got on the, the, the register of eligible hires and was hanging out on that for a while. You know, you can hang out on that for about 18 months uh, maximum before, uh, before you kind of age out of, the, of the, the system there. So while she was waiting, the year rolled around and she could take the Ford Service written test again. She took the test again. And she made it through the process and she failed at some point. I think she failed the orals that time. Did she change in a year? No, it just, the bar was a little bit higher that year for whatever reason, but she ended up still being uh, employed by us because she was on the register. We were able to, you know, she, her number came up and we got her into an A100 class here. So, so if you're at all interested in the foreign service or any of those career tracks that I just mentioned, my suggestion to folks is, you know, open the door. This is what it is. Taking the exam is just opening the door. And um, you won't, you'll have zero chance of joining the foreign service if you don't, um, you might, you'll have a, you'll have some chance by if you do, and it's not a commitment to join us at the end. We're not the army. We're not going to come after you. Oh, you signed a piece of paper and you we're going to come after you. No, it's, it allows you to make those decisions a little bit later on. And, uh, you know, my, my story is a little bit like that, where um, I took the exam in 1999 uh, while I was in grad school in uh, at Indiana University. And <clears throat> I, didn't even know what the Foreign Service was. I had heard, overheard a couple of people at, uh, at, at the cafeteria talking about the Foreign Service. I, my roommate and I went over there and talked to him a little bit about it. And uh, we both decided to take the exam. My, my, my roommate was really going home about it. We took it, I passed it, he didn't. I, may, I passed the orals. And, and then I waited. This was early 2000 when I passed the, the orals. I waited and I waited and I, I continued my life. I, I left Indiana University, I transferred to the University of Pennsylvania to conclude, uh, to conclude my graduate studies. I was sitting there and then, you know, I was working towards getting my doctorate and then the 9-11 happened. And I was doing, uh, I was doing religious studies, doing Central Asian history, Central Asian poetry between the 16th and 19th centuries. Um, I can, can't tell you a, a less marketable degree out there, quite honestly, uh, really is a, not a lot of job prospects, but 9-11 happened. And I realized at that point, like I was doing something so narrow, something so minute. And it was something that the impact that I was going to have as a professional was going to be fine, but it was the number of people I could affect it with what I was pursuing was going to be rather small. And I wanted to feel that I was contributing a little bit better. And I saw that my country was going to be in conflict with the region that I knew very well. Um, and I had language skills and I had um, you know, knowledge that contributed to that. And so I was like, what's happening with my State Department application? And it was about that time they got to, I was cleared. I got my clearance at that point, shortly at the end of 2001, they offered me to join at the end of 2001. I couldn't start immediately because I had uh, committed to another year of teaching at the school. 
at the Ed Penn. Um, so I joined the summer after uh, uh, the, the spring term in, in 2002. Uh, July 1st, 2002, I joined. And by October, I was in Saudi Arabia adjudicating visa applications. And I replaced uh, one of the officers that issued 11 of the 15 hijacker visas from 9-11. From so I, I got to do really impactful, immediate work um, seemingly very quickly after I had made that conscious decision to join the Foreign Service. But had I had not done that, taken that test back in 99, you know, two years prior, more than two years prior, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. So just saying that by, by means of saying, if this is something you were thinking about at any point, you might as well start down the path. Um, when can you apply? Like I said, it's, we offer that test three times a year for Foreign Service officers. Uh, you can apply for information management specialist, consular fellows, office management specialist any day of the year. That's, that's open 365 days a year. All of our other specialist tracks, um, they're open when we have vacancies. And if you register at careers.state.gov, I'm actually going to go ahead and drop in the chat um, a registration URL. If you want to click on that at some point and, and go through that and register, you'll get registered with careers.state.gov and you can get updates as to when we have vacancies and events and that sort of thing. Um, uh, let me just talk briefly about civil service opportunities. So, so these are our, our colleagues in foreign affairs that work primarily in Washington, D.C. They have, uh, there are a lot of our subject matter experts. They're the people that uh, work uh, to, to uh, advise us on a lot of different things in terms of, um, you know, over international relations, thematic, thematic issues like uh, science and technology and, and environment. Um, they work in a variety of different capacities. Uh, and uh, the hiring for civil service is very, very much akin to how hiring happens in the private sector, meaning there is a vacancy and you can apply for the vacancy. Um, and all of the government hiring for civil services done through usajobs.gov, uh, which is not a great website, <laughs> I'll be very honest with you. Um, so it takes a little bit of trick uh, to understand how that works. Um, and so the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, often runs these seminars, webinars on how to maximize your profile on USA Jobs, uh, because a resume for government looks a lot different than a resume for private sector. Um, you know, where you have to have something optimized for uh, search engines and, and whatever software, or we're not using that <laughs> in the government. So we kind of have the more is more for the phenomenon when it comes to resumes in order to make sure that, you know, you see a 12 page resume at times, which is not unusual. Um, so for, uh, for the civil service, you can find a vacancy, you can apply for it, you can see the steps there on the screen there. Um, it takes a, it still takes a little bit of time because of that security clearance requirement. Most of the jobs at the State Department require some form of security clearance, so that will be several months of, of processing that, that happens behind the scenes there. Um, and, uh, you know, again, with the way the civil service works, you kind of stay in that job. If you get that job, you stay in it until you apply for something else. But once you're in the civil service, you have advantages to apply for other vacancies within the civil service. Some jobs will only be open to people that are already in the government. Um, and so it's, if, if you're interested in the civil service, it's, it's great to get your foothold in into some position and then use that to leverage and climb the ladder to, to positions closer to where you want to do career-wise. I also mentioned one other category of employment. I mentioned it very briefly at the very beginning, our consular fellows program. If you speak one of these languages, Portuguese, Chinese, Spanish, or uh, Arabic, you can uh, apply for this program, which is a fantastic program where it's uh, only committing you to five years of service as opposed to a career of service. Uh, you go and you serve overseas as a consular officer, uh, working in embassies and consulates, and, and uh, working in one of those four languages as well. So it's a great program. Um, briefly, let me go through some of our student opportunities and uh, opportunities for uh, upcoming uh, recent graduates, and then we'll go to Q&A here. Um, uh, student opportunities, we have many internships. Uh, we have unpaid internships that run fall, spring, and summer. We have some unpaid internships uh, that are open uh, for returning students the U.S. Foreign Service uh, Internship Program, USFSIP, um, that is partially merit-based, partially need-based. That runs, uh, we've already made selections for next summer already, but that would open up again in the summertime. Uh, we also have the uh, Virtual Student Federal Service, which is open uh, in July. Uh, this is, allows you to apply for a sort of year-long internship program uh, where you're, you're committing to about 10 hours a week on a project basis with a mentor in the federal government and the State Department is one of the major users of BSFS. I've got five BSFS interns currently, including a couple of UW students uh, working with me um, this, this semester or this year. Um, uh, for graduate school, you're already all in graduate school, so I won't necessarily uh, worry about, about these fellowships, the Pickering Wrangell, our, our graduate fellowships uh, that pay for two years of graduate school and then get you entry into the Foreign Service at the end of that. 
We also have our Foreign Affairs IT Fellowship. These are for folks that are going into IT fields similar that paid for two years of school, whether it's a graduate program or, or last year's of undergraduate, and again, get entry into the Foreign Service after that. And then you have your litany. I'm sure you could talk to Melanie and her team about all of the study abroad opportunities that are available, all the scholarships that are there, Gilman, Critical Language, Boren, Fulbright. Um, also, you can get information at the website here below my name, careers.state.gov. Um, we've got lots of information. So if you want to study a language overseas, these are government will pay for it. Uh, so don't don't ever pay, don't ever pay to study a language. Let, get Uncle Sam to pay for it. Um, for those of you who are going to graduate soon or will graduate, and hopefully you all graduate soon, um, we have our Presidential Management Fellowship Program. Um, this is a great way to get entree into the civil service. It's a competitive program, incredibly competitive program, but uh, the benefits are many, and you get to really do substantive work very early on in your career. Um, it's it's the closest thing we have to a to a mid level entry program within the civil service. Um, you work, you, you get hired, um, you get selected as fellow, you get hired at an agency, and you get to work for two up to two years. And then at the end of those program that program, you get non competitive advantage for other vacancies within the civil service here. Um, and then we have also another route into the civil service called the Pathways Recent Graduate Internships. So the, and if you're within two years of completing any degree, associates, bachelor's, master's, doctorate, you name it, you can apply for these vacancies and they're all advertised through um, usajobs.gov. And the cool thing about these things is that you work in the job uh, as an intern for one to two years, but then at the end of that period, if you successfully complete the program, you're just given the job on a full-time basis. So it can be a great way uh, to enter with little government experience and then leave with quite a bit and, and to leverage that to another position. Um, so that's where I'm kind of kind of end. Uh, let me just let you know how you can stay in contact with me and we'll, and we'll go into Q&A here. Um, so lots of ways, I'm, you know, I'm the diplomat residence for the Northwest to cover Alaska, Washington, Oregon, um, and Northern California. So I'm here as a resource, not just for students, but for anyone in the community, um, any of these communities that is interested in learning more about the State Department Foreign Service. So um, first thing, if you want to contact me, you can see my email at the bottom of the screen here, dirnorthwest at state.gov. Feel free to take note of that. You can send me an email. I'm happy to respond, respond to you there. Um, you may not be on Facebook anymore, but we are. So if you want to go to uh, Diplomat in Residence Northwest at, on the Facebook, you can, uh, I just said the Facebook. On Facebook, you can, um, you can definitely connect with us. We'll have events on there periodically. You'll see announcements and, and advertisements for us. Uh, also, you can follow U.S. Department of State on LinkedIn. And then um, uh, you, I dropped that Earl into the chat there, but you can through through that website, through the careers.state.gov web website, you can get a link to um, sign up for my office hours. I office I offer office hours every week um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So people, anyone can sign up for these um, and they're, we conduct them virtually. Uh, so they're not just, uh, you know, for our folks that are here at Berkeley at the university that I'm, that I'm hosted at here in California. Uh, so I'm happy to do one-on-one -on -one consultations with you that way. Anyway, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, we'll go to questions and answers. Melanie, thank you for dropping those links in the into the chat as well. Absolutely. And um, so for our students here, feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself, or you can also leave your question in the chat and I'm happy to read that for you. I think I'll open us up with a question. Right. Oh, actually, go, go ahead, Brianna. Hi, thanks. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more specifically, specifically about work that you've done and, you know, just elaborate on, on the variety of experiences you've had. Sure. I'm always happy to talk about myself, sure. Uh, it's, um, you know, it, I've done, like, you heard the sort of job uh, list that I went through there, but like, uh, you know, maybe I could talk about an accomplishment for each of these assignments that I, I really took a lot of pride in. So like, um, my second assignment in, when I was in the cultural affairs officer in Beirut, uh, one of the one of the tasks I had was to manage a was about $3 million program called the access micro scholarship program. And this was these were small micro scholarships for teaching English to um, as a second language to high school students. And we had um, about 950 students in Lebanon that we had in this program in 27 different clusters around the country. And, uh, you know, and then in and of itself, that's an inherently good thing, right? From an ethical moral standpoint, hey, we're teaching English, we're doing something like this. But we had, we designed the program to also make a political point. So um, we put these clusters in places where um, people didn't like the United States primarily. And, and in fact, we were able to get 
um, English language clusters in Bazuria in southern Lebanon, as well as in Bint Jbeil in southern Lebanon. So uh, Bint Jbeil is the sort of capital of Hezbollah um, in, in southern Lebanon, and Bazuria was the hometown of Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah. So symbolically, we were putting you know, something where I physically couldn't go there. The embassy couldn't go to those places. It was too dangerous for us. But there was no way that the community was going to say no to free English language instruction. So we were able to get a message out and, and have an implicit message like, hey, we hear, we're having contact. We're having some sort of dialogue with this community that was largely closed off to us. And it was, you know, we, those kids would come to the embassy every year. We do a big Fourth of July party for them. And I, one day, one year, I remember we had this young Shia, Shia woman that came up and represented her class and she gave a speech. You know, it's like, and it basically it boiled down to, you know, I may not respect America, I may not agree with you, but at least now I have the English language and we can have a conversation about that. And, and so, you know, for me, that's like, okay, really early in my career, how do you make, how do you find a way in which we're advancing US interests, not just do the, the good thing of, and do, do something that is good and advancing something at the same time. Um, I think about my time in, in uh, uh, Yemen. I was there in 2008 when the uh, embassy was bombed. We were attacked by Al Qaeda. Uh, we had about uh, 11 people killed outside of our embassy that day. Uh, two car bombs went off and, and five suicide bombers uh, attempted to detonate their, their suicide belts. Um, and kind of working through that crisis, I, I did a number of media interviews in the wake of that conference, of that crisis on that day with U.S. media, with Arabic language media, it really taught me about crisis communication, uh, how to deal with ambiguity, you know, what can we, what do we actually know to be true, um, and making sure that we're sharing information the right way, not just to keep ourselves safe, but, but to keep Americans informed and to keep our government informed about what was going on there. I think about, um, uh, you know, uh, when I worked in London, when I worked in London as the regional media hub director and as the spokesperson for the Department of State in Arabic, I did hundreds of interviews on Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya and different different networks there in Arabic, defending our policy. It really taught me about um, the the need to deforce your your individual ideas and uh, and you know your you know, no one cares about what Ryan Glia has to say about something. They do care about what the U.S. government position is on a particular policy issue. And so I had to learn how to, okay, here's what I believe, but I'm, I'm now in a role as a government spokesperson, how to sort of remove my ego from that equation and be able to embody what the administration's position was on something and do that convincingly in a way to connect with people, even though I didn't necessarily agree 100% all the time with, with what, what I had to defend. Um, I think about my time in Doha, Qatar, as a uh, as the deputy chief of mission, running, helping run that embassy as the number two person at the embassy, um, and then going into 2007 to 2017, uh, the summer of 2017 is when when Qatar got cut off from its neighbors. We had the Gulf crisis that had started. Um, I remember it well because my son was born in May <laughs> of that year, and we were on. I was on paternity leave when I get a call from the ambassador saying yeah, I needed to come back <laughs> off of paternity leave, and she was leaving in June. She left. Um, and we still haven't had an ambassador appointed to Qatar since 2017. So for that last year, I was the charge d'affaires. I was, in, uh, I was there from 2017, 2018. So running an embassy, having a brand new baby in our household and try to do this all at the same time under big stress. And then we, we came up with a, a new counterterrorism agreement with the, with the Qataris at that time and implementing that. And we started a strategic dialogue. So that's I learned how to how do you juggle everything at the same time, your personal and your professional life in order to, um, to try to get good, uh, good accomplishments there. And then I think about the last year and a half in, J in Jeddah, you know, as the, as the head of the consulate there under a COVID situation, how do we adapt our, our, our working environment, uh, our, our sort of uh, norms in order to still try to be effective at the, with our core mission, what at the same time keeping people safe and keeping people, um, you know, I was very proud of the fact that we were able to quickly adjust our, you know, to continue to be engaging with the Saudi public in the areas that we were we needed to, but um, we're able to quickly get the, onto a technological platform where people could do those things from the safety of their home, except for the things that absolutely must be done at the office because of uh, security concerns or uh, it's classified information that way. But at the embassy, at our at the embassy in Riyadh, they had lots of problems with transmission of COVID. I was very proud to say, even after you know, we still have had zero COVID cases of transmission at that consulate in, in Jeddah. And it's a very large, you know, it's a 350 person workplace, but because of the steps we had in place, we had cases, but they were not ever uh, for people that had been exposed at work. Uh, so we, you know, 
uh, very proud of how we can adapt very quickly to a different a different environment, uh, making sure that we are still accomplishing our goals, but at the same time keeping people as safe as possible for those things. So I, I've learned a lot. You know, I got a lot of. I've been very lucky to do lots of different things, and I've learned a lot from each of these things. Um, and that's kind of what it boils down to is like what being a FSO is really about having those skills that in when there's a conflict, you know, you can't go to training for half of these things, right? You, you can get certain skills, but you can't go, in, you know, for the, in, in the month of October, they pulled me out of this assignment. And they sent me to um, Fort Pickett, Virginia for a month <laughs> working with, on Afghanistan resettlement. So I led the, the team there um, where we had 10,000 Afghan refugees at in Fort Pickett, Virginia at a, at a, uh, National Guard base uh, living in barracks, you know, trying to get these folks through the resettlement process. I mean, I, I don't work in resettlement. That's not my career. But they said, okay, well, you're senior foreign service officer. You should be able to do this. <laughs> and so, and I, and we did. We, as a team, we came up with solutions, and we, we got people, through, you know, through that process and starting to be resettled in, in many places around the country. Um, and that's sort of what the culmination of what we look for and why we push people through this process is that it is an apprenticeship in many ways. You start. Very, very simple in many ways, but you're still taking decisions on behalf of the U.S. government, even at that very early stage. You know, you start doing. Everyone does visa work at their at one of their first two assignments, so you're taking a decision right there. Is this person in front of you a security threat? Is this person going to contribute to our relationship with the host nation? Is it going to help contribute to our economy? This person's going to travel, so you're taking a decision on behalf of the U.S. government. Um, it's important, but it's, the scope is limited to that one person maybe in front of you. But as your career develops, you, you gain more authority, you gain more responsibility, and you know, soon you're negotiating counterterrorism agreements with a foreign country, or you're, you're working on evacuating people from, you know, I worked in Lebanon during the evacuation in 2006 uh, of people during the, the, the July war. And so like, it's, 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 you don't really realize this, but you accrue, the, you accrue these skills over the course of your career, and then you're ready to take on these, ma these massively complex problem sets uh, going forward. Um, and that's, really what I, I really feel very confident that I can, I can take on complex uh, issues and have a contribution to that in a way because of the training and because of all the experiences I've had. Ryan, to your point of, of some of these skills, um, you not really having, uh, you know, the academic training or the background to really grow that. You kind of experience it on the job. And of those 13 dimensions, would you say that there's um, a few sets over another where the Foreign Service could really benefit from, from folks who exercise like objectivity or leadership and initiative? Um, I know that holistically those 13 dimensions are crucial um, for success and all of that, but are there any that you feel like are um, underestimated that you think are really valuable? Um, I, I think composure <laughs> and working with others. Those are the things, because we, we, these are stressful situations and it's human nature to respond to stress, right? And um, especially as you get further on in your career, you need to be able to keep that calm composure and always keep it, think about something from multiple facets, you know, is it, how is it affecting you? How is it affecting your team? How is it affecting your enterprise? How is it affecting the U.S. writ large in a particular circumstance there? Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes very hard to get beyond just how is this affecting me, right? You know, COVID was kind of like that, I think, in many ways for, for many people. Like, how, I'm, I'm taking steps to keep myself safe and my, my family safe. But beyond that, you know, we had the, I had the responsibility and the, and the leadership, senior leadership team had the responsibility to think about, okay, how's that affecting our team? But how is that affecting our ability to help Americans? Um, you know, how can we keep our, our consulate open to assist uh, Americans at the same time? And so um, a lot of people just wanted to stay home the whole time, right? Like they, and so it, the composure and working with others piece of it, it's, that is such you know, it seems very kindergartenish kind of thing. Like, you know, of course you should be composed. Of course you should be able to work with others. But it, those are the first things that break down when we're under stress. And I think uh, in a large sense, those are the things that are most un underestimated. 
and and those are the hard and those are the things that we actually try to test for quite a bit in our intake process. So if we look at um, the situational judgment portions of the written exam or the the, the uh, scenarios that we set up in um, oral examination, they're meant to test those things and amongst all the other dimensions. But those are the things that I think people take for granted, don't work on, don't develop, or don't sort of take that pause and breath and, and really consider what their response might be. All right. Um, I was just curious. I know that you probably do a lot of these talks to a lot of different schools, but I was curious about um, what values from Evan's students um, make you want one of our students to work in the Foreign Service? Sure. Well, I think um, Evans, uh, the Evans School in particular, um, helps develop people with this broad view of, of how the world operates and understands, you know, um, all the you know, different trends and different waves of, of what's happening on an economic front and on a political front. I mean, just awareness, I mean, awareness of how the world operates is, is essential to being a successful foreign service officer. And I think um, you look at the average age of people joining the foreign service now, it's now about 32, 33 years old. And what it, in Evans School, you know, you have a lot of people that are coming in after being in the workforce uh, quite a bit and, and working on a master's degree that's that profile that are it's the same profile of people that tend to be more successful in our intake process because they have more life experience more awareness of what's happening um, and have developed that over more time and therefore that shows through in our in our in our process you have more polished 13 dimensions uh, than than a lot of other candidates because of that that experience i mean we still we do have some people that join right out of undergraduate I mean, it's sort of, it's kind of silly that these diplomats and residents that we're, we're housed at universities because the vast majority of our, of our recruits are not coming from a university. <laughs> They're coming from, uh, you know, from the real world, <laughs> no offense. They're coming from, uh, from the, the workplace or coming from the private sector or from another government agency for that matter. And so, uh, but when we go to look at folks that are in graduate programs and, and in graduate programs that are internationally focused, those are folks that, yeah, they've had experience. They tend to have a language already. They tend to have maybe some international experience. They tend to have had cross-cultural interactions and, they, and their worlds are larger. Their, their perception of the world is, is much wider. And so that's that's what, that what makes them more successful in, in the whole selection process. Just a quick follow-up on that. I mean, where do you see an Evans student being able to flex those skills that we've learned um, that we're all working so hard to learn right now? Well, I mean, that's the thing. We put you to work right immediately once you join here. So that's, you know, uh, as much as we, we put you through training and we commit to that, I mean, so much of what you have to learn, as, as Melanie was, was sort of alluding to earlier, is, is it's on the job. And so we, we require people at the very beginning to operate at a very high level. You know, uh, we give you the training for it, but it's also a lot of, can you figure out this job? <laughs> and sometimes you're not really given a lot of, I mean, some embassies are tiny. Some embassies are maybe going to be 10 or 15 people maximum. And you may have a breadth of responsibility that is far beyond anything you've ever experienced before. And you've got to, you know, and you definitely won't be trained enough to do all of the things that you'd be asked for. So it's the idea, it's, it's, you understand the bigger picture. Can you figure out how, how your piece fits into what's happening locally at your post in broader in the region, broader with, broader still with the, uh, with the agency and broader still with the with the breadth of the U.S. government here. I mean, the U.S. government is the most complicated entity to ever to exist on the planet, right? And it's almost impossible for any individual to actually have the entire picture. And so you, you have to recognize that and have those instincts of how, okay, I'm only going to see this percentage, this slice of the pie. I need to execute it in a way that allows my, my pie piece to fit in with all the other pie pieces. And it, we actually have to be able to be pushing in the right direction towards what are our policy goal here? So you have to be aware of the macro and the macro at the same time. You have to be aware of the U.S. interest and the local interest. You have to be aware of the of the trade craft necessary to actually uh, effectuate a, a positive action on something. You have to be able to do all those things simultaneously and juggle that out. And in the meanwhile, you have to live a life, and you have to be happy, and you have to have a family that you know, you know, if you, that's what you choose, uh, that that feels fulfilled and such. So it's it we really require people that can do all that sort of balance, and you know. Um, you know, not, I think the Evans School is one that helps prepare people in that way. Um, and we've had lots of successful, I mean, 
Uh, Washington State is is a little bit under or Washington, the state of Washington is underrepresented in uh, the Foreign Service a little bit. I think the entirety of the West Coast is underrepresented because it's uh, um, I don't for whatever reason historically most people you know, people on the East Coast know a little bit more about the Foreign Service as an option. I think um, I certainly you know growing up in the Southwest didn't know anything about the Foreign Service, but um, but that being said, I think. UW in particular and the Evans School is is fairly well represented within the State Department because of the the skill sets that are developed and and the, and the graduates that go on and and participate. But um, we'd love to see more. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate that. No problem. Uh, oh, go ahead, Ashton. Um, Ryan, I was just curious, what's the process look like for actually determining where your post would be, whether that's after um, you first get through application or whether that's later on in your career? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, for Foreign Service, it's um, your, when you join, your first five years, you're considered uh, what's called untenured. So you have a, a five-year basically probationary period where you do two assignments that are directed. So you don't really have a lot of say in where you go for those first two assignments. And in the, in the course of those two assignments, you're evaluated uh, every year, and then you're reviewed after your first three years for tenure, um, which means basically you're a permanent employee of, of the Foreign Service. Um, and then you were considered at, at that point a mid-level mid uh, officer. So those first two assignments, you kind of have a little bit of a dialogue with uh, what's called a career development officer. This is another Foreign Service officer that works for our, our HR Bureau or what we call now the Global Talent Management Bureau. And they, they, you know, they'll take in some consideration what you want and what you, uh, where your skill sets are, but you, you are, well, you will be assigned someplace and you will go to that place. You don't have a lot of choice for those first two. Um, but for your third and subsequent assignments, usually um, you, you are considered a mid-level officer and therefore you get to bid on what's called the open assignment cycle. And so you get to see at the beginning of that cycle, what are the positions that are open that are at your grade and that are in your career track and that you would be necessarily technically eligible to apply for. And then you bid on them. Basically, you select the ones you, and you rank order the ones you'd like to pursue. You interview with the, with the um, hiring managers for each of those positions uh, at the post and at the, in the bureau level. And then, um, then you get to accept or decline an assignment as it comes to you. That being said, there's a limited number of postings uh, every cycle. So, you know, it's, and there's competition, especially for um, some of the, the more choice positions there. Uh, but you do get a chance to pursue assignments in locations you might want to pursue or, or in a specialization that you might want to pursue more easily at the, at this, at the, uh, at the mid level. And then you get to the senior level where the number of jobs like drafts <laughs> drops down drastically. So you, you theoretically get to, to, to pursue jobs that you want, but like the number of jobs that are out there are really tiny. So you you may end up getting to going to a place that you don't necessarily want to go to, but it's it's where the needs of the service uh, um, need you to be. Uh, and you'll and you'll go to the and go do that. Um, so there's always that haunting in the background. What are the needs of the service? Um, and it's always the joke, right? Like you come in, you know, hey, you come in the, to the foreign service, you speak fluent Mandarin, we're going to teach you Spanish and you're going to go to Monterey, right? Like it's going to be, it's going to be one of those situations because at that time, so how did I end up in Jeddah? This is a great story. I'll get a really brief story. My first assignment, those summer of 2002, uh, this is after 9-11, you know, there's a big debate about whether the State Department is going to retain um, the visa function. This is 2002 is when we established the Department of Homeland Security. And there was talk about removing the visa function from the State Department and giving it to the new agency and the State Department was fighting this. And this is all happening on the Hill right during our orientation class. We got a list of classes, a list of posts. We submitted our bids. And then a few days later, they took the list back from us and they gave us a new list. And on that list was a whole bunch of Saudi Arabia posts <laughs> and including a post in Jeddah that was a now vacancy, like we're gonna fill it immediately out of this class. And what had happened on the Hill was they were very unhappy with what had happened with the issuance of 9-11 uh, hijackers visas from Saudi Arabia, there was a bad process that was in place. Um, and so they, and they looked at the current staffing in Saudi Arabia and they noted that they had zero Arabic speaking officers in Jeddah currently at that point in 2002. And lo and behold, I was the only Arabic speaker <laughs> in my orientation class. And so I was gonna go to Jeddah no matter what, whether I put it as number one or, or zero or 30 or not even on my list, I was gonna go to Jeddah. That's how it was gonna be. And that, sure enough, that's where I ended up. So um, I also spoke Uzbek. I also spoke some other languages. I spoke Turkmen. There was a Turkmen post on our class. 
that didn't matter. I, I spoke Arabic and, and that's great. And subsequently, you know, even though I've done Central Asian studies for most of my graduate school, I've never served in Central Asia. <laughs> I've never had to use that, those talents. But that's, you know, it's, it's worked out well for me. My, my Arabic has taken me uh, down the path that I think is in the right path for me at this point. But um, that being said, you know, you have a little bit of ability, flexibility once you get tenured to, to pursue different things. But there always is going to be that needs of the service and they, the, the government we ask you to do something uh, because they need you to do it. Thank you so much, Ryan. I just want to be mindful of our time. Your first group for informational interview starts at 2 p.m. Um, so for folks in here, feel free to use your reaction emojis to thank Ryan for taking the time to meet with us. Um, as I mentioned, there are still some time slots available for informational interviews. If you'd like to take advantage of that, feel free to linger behind. I'm happy to send you a Teams link. Um, but yeah, this is our, our time with Ryan. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. I look forward to talking to some of you soon.